Welcome to this week's Manchester Lecture. This week is a case study of the Stone Roses, and this week's guest lecturer is John Robb, the biographer of the Stone Roses. The Stone Roses recently reformed after a long break, um, and this has been to huge critical success. The Stone Roses have been on a sellout world tour, um, and some examples is of the three nights they played at Heaton Park when they returned to Manchester. Each night they played to 80,000 people at three sellout gigs. The Stone Roses are still on their world tour, again receiving critical success. The Stone Roses formed in the mid 1980s and released the first album in the late 1980s, splitting in the mid 1990s and recently reforming. The next clip is an overview of the lecture from John Robb, and also uh, there's a SoundCloud file available with an audio recording of the full lecture. This is available on SoundCloud and through a number of links. The reason why the Stone Roses are talked about after all these decades is probably due to their debut album, which is still one of the greatest debut albums ever released, but also the cultural impact the band made when they burst onto the Manchester scene and the national scene in the late 80s. The band perfectly captured the feeling at the time of the kind of post-Acid House culture. The idea that people, the Acid House had a massive impact, which is actually, most people don't really talk about that much these days, but sartorially, drug-wise, culturally, it was really big. But a lot of people didn't particularly get on with the music. And I think bands like the Stone Roses, and to a lesser extent the Happy Mondays, really captured that kind of woozy, wonky, druggy vibe at the time. With that kind of music, which kind of late 80s psychedelia, it's kind of psychedelic, but not like 60s psychedelia. If you play their records back to back with 60s psychedelic bands, they sound very, very different. So it's, they also had this feeling that it's all about the audience, the crowds, and it's, you know they understood, they embraced the big crowd thing. It was independent music at that point in time. I'd be, be more like elitist sort of. It was, it was where people really got it. And it's nothing wrong with elitist music. It's good to have music that belongs to you. But the Roses had this understanding that music is for everybody. And that they really, and the gigs, you see they had this kind of feeling about them, this, this the vibe that ran through Blackpool, uh, and Empress, Bo you know, Empress Bora and Blackpool, then Ali Pali, and then Spike Island. It was really part, part of that. I mean, Spike Island was a gig, but it felt like a rave, sort of. It had that idea the, the vastness of it. And this is in a, in a, in a period that's pre-festival periods. I mean, you had Glastonbury and Reading, but it's not like now where every field in England has a festival in it. A lot of it comes to that kind of culture. So the Stone Roses kind of catch that feeling. They, and what they put in place was this idea of classic as well, this idea that, that you, do, you shouldn't be so scared of the past. I mean, after punk, people have been trying to be really original, which is a brilliant thing, and invent music on their own turn to their own generation. What the Stone Roses did was embrace the classics, the Beatles, Hendrix, Sly Stone, and they kind of sliced it all up and created their own music out of it, which doesn't particularly sound like any of those people, but references them in a certain way. And they wrote songs that they, they wanted to be generational songs that would last like for decades, which at the time seemed like a very grand ambition, but now seems really, really obvious. They, they also had brilliant musicianship as well. And at that point, the independent scene has some good musicians in it, but musicians, that, Musicianship in punk was a dirty word, but the Stone Roses kind of reinvented it as something to aspire to. An amazing drummer in Rennie, great guitar player in Ian Brown, and a great bass player in Manny. And Ian Brown had this really stunning presence as well, like a proper old school rock star, like Mick Jagger, all those kind of people. Somebody, you know, there's, there's that shoegazing thing which was around just after the Stone Roses, this idea that it's not about projecting, it's not about being a star. The much maligned phrase X Factor, which has become like a really tawdry TV programme, Ian Brown definitely had that as a singer. Just that thing where you just walk on a stage and have the crowd in part of his hands, which is something that people are not even consciously can do. And it's a very, very rare thing to see. And it was great to see in the bands that came to the city that you were living in. So these are all kind of facts that made them really, really important. And their influence has just been absolutely massive. Most British bands in the 90s were either directly musically and sartorially influenced by the Stone Roses or just operating in the space they created. Because in the 80s, mainstream um, media didn't really deal with guitar bands. It was, it was something that was awkward. You know, you look at the Smiths, they didn't get radio play. They're a big band, you know, they got the top of the pops and that. But it was, and, and, and the Stone Roses was something that was, went a little bit further in a sense, they actually got bigger than the UK and the Smiths. It's it was a very, very British phenomenon as well. It wasn't, it's Europe it touched and America not really. So it's, 
it's, it's something quintessentially British. They made a fantastic album, which stands the test of time, a record that's as good as the Beatles records. And that's probably going to be their calling card forever. But let's not forget the cultural impact the band actually made and how it extends through the generations.